smiling from the coast for the main expedition. But scarcely was unloading completed when strange thin mist rising from the water told that new ice was already beginning to form and for the little ship this spelt danger. She must sail at once or be frozen in for the whole winter. There was not even time to move up the 350 tons of stores hastily unloaded onto the sea ice. That would be a problem. No one sailed away to safety. The sea ice was broken up by a gale. Some of the stores, including most of the fuel for heating, floated out to sea and were lost. For the eight men of the advance party, a winter to be survived in four small tents and an empty tractor crate, in temperatures 60 below. Stage two, November 1956. A brand new polar vessel, the Danish ship Magadan, leaves London, bound for Antarctica. The main party of the Commonwealth Trans-Antarctic Expedition was underway, with men of the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia and South Africa. It has taken their leader, Sir Vivian Fuchs, six years of planning and organisation to reach this moment. At the same time, and a part of that same plan, in the southern Alps of New Zealand, a group of men under Sir Edmund Hillary were training. The conditions similar to those that they would meet in Antarctica. Pilots who would have to land on skis must try out every kind. Not always successfully. Mechanization and dogs. Both to play a key role in the plan. Huskies bred and selected in Greenland. Still the best means of hauling sledges when scouting a route through unknown and difficult terrain. Before the real test, dogs and drivers meet and train to work together. Magadan, 7,500 miles from London. Past the island of South Georgia, last landfall before the polar continent. John Stevenson, from Brisbane, was our geologist. Bunny Fuchs, proved the champion's cover. David Pratt, engineer in charge of all the vehicles, could only skip backwards. Hal Lister had his own ideas about taking exercise. We had six weeks good weather, but that was behind. In this part of the southern hemisphere, the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Ocean meet in one great sweep of unbroken sea that circles the globe. Again, the defences of Antarctica. The menacing pack ice of the Weddell Sea. A sea like no other, never entirely free of ice and in winter impassable, frozen solid. As it breaks up in the summer months, the circular movement of the currents creates an enormous slow motion whirlpool of floating ice. Through this, the Magadan steam crossing the Antarctic Circle into 24 hours of daylight. At midnight, the sun lay low on the horizon, reflecting the ship's hull warmly on the floes. Wind and current can close the ice around a ship like a giant trap. Such is the barrier, even in summer, that must be penetrated before the Antarctic continent can be reached. A barrier that has defeated intrepid sailors and explorers in the past. Great men have challenged these defences in quest of the South Pole and the secrets of Antarctica. Their example and discoveries paved the way for our own expedition and we can look at the very early silent films of their work in the South which still bring alive for us the struggle and valour of these pioneers. These scenes were made in 1911 by Herbert Ponting, a member of Scott's last expedition. Captain Scott believed that the use of dogs for sledging inflicted suffering on the animals. We know today 
that dogs do not suffer when properly treated. Nevertheless, Scott relied entirely on manholding. He and his companions each dragged a sledge weight of 190 pounds. They did this on rations that analysis has revealed to be totally devoid of vitamin C and of a calorie value that allowed no margin above bare subsistence level. On such a diet, four months is about as long as men could be expected to survive under such physical strain and in these extremes of cold and altitude. They manhauled their sledge up the longest valley glacier in the world, the Beardmore. 100 miles of rough broken ice and pressure ridges, rising to 10,000 feet. Little wonder that by their fifth month sores were refusing to heal, that lassitude and nervous and physical exhaustion had set in. It was not from starvation alone that Captain Scott and his gallant comrades perished. On reaching the pole, the bitter discovery that they had been beaten. Scott wrote, we found the remains of a camp and the clear trace of dogs' paws, many dogs. The Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen, had arrived first using dog teams. Three years later, in 1914, the ship Endurance plunged into the Antarctic pack ice. Ernest Shackleton was returning to the south, planning this time to cross the entire continent. For his party, he had organized exceptionally good sledge rations and he was equipped with first-rate dog teams. Then, a gale packed ice around the ship. Attempts to free endurance were unavailing. The ice froze round her heart. They must prepare for a winter of darkness on the ice and he declared the ship a shore station. For months, the ice heaved and cracked around the endurance. Frank Hurley, who filmed these scenes, wrote, We are the embodiment of helpless futility and can only look impotently on. The line of pressure now assaults the ship and she is heaved up to the crest of the ridge like a toy. The ship is doomed. Shackleton's plan met with near disaster. He had conceived the idea of crossing the entire Antarctic continent. You may be surprised to hear that a thousand or more were clamoring to join us, but we only needed 16. All were to be specialists, both in their own field and to some extent in others. I had spent 10 years on Antarctic work, both at home and... And it was in the end that I first thought of the possibility of carrying out the plan which uh, Sorry, God. or mountains, perhaps there are several land masses. Modern seismic methods could tell us something of this. Then we wanted to know more about the weather and indeed about the mountains which we see at the surface and the rocks which compose them. These and other questions could only be answered by travelling across the continent on the ground. The Magadan, with her powerful engine and the hull specially constructed to withstand the enormous pressure of polar ice, could expect to do better than the Endurance. For seven days she had forced a passage. Then the pack ice thinned, telling of the approaching continent. For on the fringe of the sluggish sea of ice lies a moat of clear water. And beyond the moat, the bastions of Antarctica, great barriers of ice towering 200 feet, guarding a mysterious continent still in the Ice Age. Magadan, journey's end. And to a low skirting of sea ice, her 2,000 horsepower smash apart, carving her own dock.
Snowcats, tractors specially designed for snow travel, together with fuel and stores, are unloaded for the base, named after Shackleton. Everything needed to keep men alive in a hostile continent for another two years. Hillary and his supporting party had already arrived. On both sides, there was much to do before the months of winter darkness would put exploration to a halt. Hillary's party first made use of their dog teams to help shift materials for their base, named after Scott. Only weeks now remained in which to survey routes. From the homing landmark of Mount Erebus, known volcanic feature of Antarctica, Hillary's pilots flew him inland. Mountains and more mountains. Perhaps impossible for dog teams and certainly for vehicles. But finally, a glacier offering a way in long, easy sweeps up onto the polar plateau. The Skelton Glacier. There they must find their route. From Shackleton Base, 2,000 miles away, Fuchs too was seeking his route to the polar plateau. And all too soon, the obstacles came in view. Forty miles inland and straddling the direct path to the pole, an immense chasm 200 yards across, 30 miles long. Was it the cleavage line of an immense iceberg, destined to break off from the continent and float into the South Atlantic? A hundred and fifty miles inland, the Theron Mountains to be crossed or skirted. A massive escarpment holding back the inland ice and falling 4,000 feet in one great cliff. A cliff exposing millions of years of the world's history. Here were found coal seams and the fossil remains of a once luxuriant tropical vegetation. 50 miles on, another range. A strange sight. Mountains buried up to their necks in ice and snow. A colossal solid mass of ice filling valleys thousands of feet deep. They named it the Shackleton Range. Further inland still, Fuchs must set up and stock a station that would serve as his main supply depot on the way to the pole. A desert of ice without a single feature to break its monotony, 300 miles south from Shackleton Base. But at least it was flat and a plane could touch down. Here, three men would build the depot and live through winter doing planned scientific work. We call this dump South Ice. In Antarctica, you build your house in a hole. You make use of the drifting snow. Very soon, it'll pile up to the roof and help to keep the heat in. In relays from Shackleton, a ton load at a time, they brought in the scientific equipment, the food and fuel, and the prefabricated parts of the hut. South Ice, our pilots John Lewis and Gordon Haslip made flight after flight. The base you build will last for many years, even if you only need it for two. It has to be solid to stand up to blizzards and the terrific weight of drifting snow that will bury it completely in a matter of weeks. Hal Lister, our glaciologist, would make studies to help us know whether the crystal structure of the ice evidence of weather for many years past. And Ken Blakelock would carry out the Met observations. Even before the hut was built, his weather reports were being radioed through Shackleton to the world. South ice was always colder than Shackleton. A continent in its ice age allows no concessions to invaders. Everything's against you. And to survive, these three had to work on against the weather. There could be no rest or let-up. Conditions could only get worse as winter approached.
300 miles away at Shackleton. It may have been warmer, but that still didn't make it a picnic. The temperatures going down to 60 below, even to 100 degrees of frost. In this, we didn't intend the dogs to live outside. Beneath the snow, they would have a home. Our aircraft would be at the mercy of the blizzard all winter. We couldn't take it to pieces, simply because we weren't enough men to hold up the wings to put it together again. The best we could do was bury it in a flying attitude. We bulldozed a pit and put it to bed, wings level with the snow and facing into the prevailing wind. Outside, there would be four months of unbroken darkness, the Antarctic winter. Inside, life would go on as normally as we could make it. Our first rule was, when you come in, leave the outside behind. We'd build our home with our own hands, and we were as house proud as any housewife. David Stratton, deputy leader, wasn't the only one who became an expert with the needle and thread. Bunny Fox, like all of us, dealt with his own repairs. In fact, everyone did for himself. But only Gordon Haslop went as far as ironing his smalls. Throughout the winter, with no daylight hours, the clock ruled our routine. Breakfast was when the clock said eight, and he was pretty certain that Bunny Fox would be first on parade. We each did cook duty for a week at a stretch. Jeffrey Pratt, who's a geophysicist. Ralph Lentham wasn't very much at home in the hut. After all, he should. He built it. First on duty every morning was Taffy. Taffy Williams making contact with South Ice and sending out Met reports to the world. In and around the hut, there were plenty of chores to keep it all busy. We had dogs, and they must be fed. We'd stored seal meat, but the saw was needed to portion it. Winter was not hibernation. Only the men on cook duty stayed indoors continuously for any length of time. We had to go out and get in coal. We'd organized ourselves for many things, but not running water. We needed daily three gallons a man. And to get that daily, we had to go out and cut it in blocks from the snow. Then there were the physiological tests, man hauling sledges of different weights to measure our work capacity. Our South African meteorologist, Hannes Lachlan, I never could pronounce his name. Had ten of his instruments inside. This one records the speed of the wind. At the moment, a 60 knot blizzard. Our main store of food was outside in the snow, enough for two years. In the attic above the kitchen, we kept a month's supply. Each week, at the change of cook, a carefully balanced diet came through the sea. men are incapable. We scrubbed the lot out once a week. Fresh bread we made every two days. Sundays were always celebrated. A day of fresh meat and an afternoon off. Hannett, being one of the eight in the advance party, he specially relished Sunday's fresh meat. If we'd had a cat, no bone from Hannett would have done it any good. With spring approaching, Fuchs and Stratton were drawing up their final plans. All the winter had been spent in preparation of ourselves and of the machines that must carry us across. In the repair shop, David Pratt and Roy Homard had their hands full, keeping the vehicles in top condition. By now, Fuchs was in weekly contact with Hillary, who were on the other side. 
and we're counting on an overall fuel figure of two miles per gallon per vehicle, including weasels, so there's a bit of a margin there. And by the way, we're going to change the jets for altitudes to bring power up. The long Antarctic night was ending. Darkness was giving way to the twilight week. It was time now to dig out the aircraft and get everything set for the long journey. off the doorstep and we ran into trouble. You have to see a tractor in a hole before you decide how to get it out. We knew the first 300 miles would bring problems. This was the first. We were traveling with vehicles linked together by safety ropes and we certainly discussed the theory of recovery all through the winter.
south again to search a route. Dog teams to find the depots, aircraft to supply them. That was Hillary's system. And in the wake of the dog teams, the tractors. it was all smooth going. The softer the snow, the less the tractors liked it. it was necessary to walk ahead, sounding for a safe passage. 1,500 miles away, Fuchs's progress was a great deal slower. To get from the ice shelf onto the inland ice, we had to go over closely crevassed country. We couldn't go around the trouble. The only way was through. There were cracks and holes every few yards. The only answer was to probe and flag a route. Going ahead in pairs, we opened the treacherous lids to find the firmest ground. But you can't be careful and quick. It was monotonous, it was back-breaking, and it was agonizingly slow. But it was better to probe for 10 hours than spend 20 digging out a cat. Driving over them was exciting. Dropping in was shattering. It always caused damage. And worst of all, maddening delays. Vehicles weren't expendable. If we were to stick to plan, all of them must reach south ice and go beyond. We crept forward, the vehicles and sledges gouging out the lids of the crevasses. Like this, we made as little as a mile a day. One week, we only covered 11 miles. It was like driving a tank over a minefield. Except if you met it, you'd go down instead of up. Being tail end Charlie was no joke. broken and the cat poised on two crumbling walls and if they don't hold we'd lose the lot heaping snow by the miserable shovelful onto a shaky ledge we made a platform then we worked in aluminium bridging for our pontoons to grip on Despite troubles and hold-ups, and only five to six hours sleep a night, the essential scientific work went on. Every 30 miles, a seismic sounding was made. A pit was bored, and the ice core it produced was examined for temperature, grain size, and density. 48 geophones were laid out to record the echo from the explosion. The echo would travel down through the ice and bounce back from the rock below and according to the time taken for the sound to come back to the surface, the scientists would determine the thickness of the ice cap at that point. A shot each 30 miles would give a profile of the great continent beneath. Fox's plan was put on making the 2,000 mile crossing in 100 days, but each time one of the vehicles fell in a crevasse, it lost us another day. At this rate of progress, we wouldn't reach the pole, let alone the other side before winter would close in on us, and we would be stranded. No, things weren't looking too good on our side. No such setbacks for Hillary, however, with four depots ready set up. Despite some rough going, in general, for the New Zealanders, it was full speed south. Remember, it's south whichever side you're coming from.
100 miles inland, the limit of the aircraft's range, last and most southerly depot. Hillary's fifth and final fuel and food dump in readiness for the crossing party. With an aircraft as a regular ferry from Scott Base, the New Zealanders were always in closer contact with civilization. And now, according to plan, Hillary's mission was successfully accomplished. They had time to relax and to read the news from home. Here at Depot 700 was planned the meeting of Fuchs and Hillary. But the crossing party struggling so far behind schedule would be many weeks before they could point. With so much time in hand, Hillary decided that his party should attempt to go on to the pole itself. Certainly every extra mile covered would constitute a mile of known route for the crossing party. So on the tractors went. On the other side, Fuchs's party was still dodging crevasses. But now they were leaving the mountains behind and heading towards the polar plateau. After nearly a month, South Ice was reached. But there was still six times that distance to go, and only two more months to do it in. John Stevenson and Ken Blakelock left immediately to scout the route on to the pole. Ahead was unknown, but we did better going beyond the mountains. was good. The dogs were fresh and their drivers were all set to go after their winter at South Ice. South Ice was our last fuel dump before the other side of the pole and we replenished according to plan what we had used to our first month getting here. Christmas day and we were off in the wake of the dog teams. Of our load 22 tons was petrol. We were carrying our depots with us. We were eight vehicles leaving South Ice, and it was planned that we would reach Scott Base with only four. As the fuel was burnt, the weakest vehicles would be left behind. Only by these tactics could we get across. South Ice was to let now. For Hillary, with tractors never designed for work at high altitudes, Fuel consumption was now running alarmingly high. Everything superfluous jettisoned, he was pushing on the last hundred miles to the pole with three tractors and only one loaded sledge. January the 4th, 1958, with fuel for only another 20 miles, he was there. The first to make the journey over land since Captain Scott in 1912. A welcome and congratulations from the Americans at their polar station, established by air for the International Geophysical Year. Hillary radioed to Fuchs. I'm concerned about serious delay in your plans. You have major journey in front of you to reach Pole, and 1,250 more miles to Scott Base in deteriorating weather. Why not fly out from Pole and return next year to complete journey? To this, Fuchs replied, 
appreciate your concern, but there can be no question of abandoning journey. Yet still there was no easy passage for the snowcats. For now the way ahead was strewn with enormous fields of sastrugi, rock-hard ice dunes forming a frozen choppy sea that reduced their speed yet again to a snail's crawl. This terrain played havoc with the tracks and steering and made repairs a continual necessity in 50 degrees of frost. Nonetheless, the scientific program was faithfully maintained. On the 59th day, with the going easier at last, two events spurred the party. They learned that their expedition plane had reached Scott Base. The RAF party had made this non-stop pioneering flight from South Ice via the pole with a long-range tank that allowed them only one hour's reserve of fuel. There were congratulations to John Lewis, Gordon Haslop, Peter Weston and Taffy Williams for their great achievement. Back in the endless expanse of snow, Fox and his navigator checked their positions. And from the top of a snow ridge they saw, at long last, some black dots on the horizon which mark the South Pole. They had caught up with their dog teams by now. Together they made the final run in. time-consuming crevasse areas could be avoided by following Hillary's inland route. And there were the well-marked successive depots of fuel that he had established for Fuchs and his party for this second stage of their crossing. It had always been planned that the two would meet at the most southerly depot. Hillary flew in, and together they travelled the last 700 miles. February the 21st, 1958 the first sight of mountains for 1,500 miles. End of an epic trek was in sight. journey that had taken 99 days. 
one day less than Fuchs had estimated when first he planned this crossing. With his companions, he headed the caravan of snowcats north for the last 25 miles. a little more about the last unknown continent on Earth. 